So you're going to see a lot of stuff that you probably didn't even know we carry. And the goal that we're going to try to accomplish here is to kind of give you some more in-depth knowledge about uh, the product line. When you see the plant tour, it's actually better to start over here because when you learn some of the features and things, then you go over to the plant and you see how it's made, you're going to understand, it's going to make more sense to you. You're going to say, oh, that's, I know why they're doing that. So, uh, so step one of cheating was to let my group be here first. All right. So, uh, but, uh, so we're going to get started on, I'm going to go through some product stuff. I'm going to start right here and we're just going to work our way around the room. Uh, obviously this is not every product that Prefort carries. We've got a, a, a lot more, but this is what we could fit in here. We also have three-point stuff located outside uh, that we'll go look at. This, there's no way we can, we can get, you know, giant sweep systems and cattle workings and, and, and the, you know, horse walkers and blah, 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 blah. You get the idea. You just can't do it. So this is kind of a representative sample of some of the top SKUs that you'll be you know, likely to carry in your store, okay? These are the types of things that you would see every day in a store. Some of the other things are a little more specialty items, okay? We'll start over here with these bunk feeders. Um, obviously, the bunk feeder is very popular. You see three different varieties that we have. You notice that all of these are powder coated, okay? Uh, but uh, we also have them where you can get them galvanized, and we also have some five footers not just 10 footers, okay? Uh, this is three different types. This is kind of a, one of our originals. This has got a replaceable liner in it. You guys can, can sell this. The line, if, if the liner gets tore up, you can order another one. Obviously, it's powder coated. It's got four support structures underneath it, as do all of them. Uh, this one is a steel bunk uh, feeder, but it's got a poly liner inside. This is kind of popular a lot of people like that poly stuff both in stalls and feeders because it doesn't uh, harbor bacteria and mold and that kind of stuff and so uh, that slide in liner if the liner gets damaged pop in another one good to go and this is an all steel bunk this thing has been extremely popular uh, with our customer base uh, we've done really well with it all three of these do well and again you can get them powder coated or you can get it in galvanized and it's five and ten foot with ten foot being the most popular. Uh, next we'll move over into the feeder category. This one's a little bit of an oddball. This is a goat feeder. Obviously basically what it is is a little five foot bunk feeder with a hay rack on top. We don't sell a tremendous amount of these. Any of you guys in goat country? So you guys might stock this if you don't already. This might be a good item for you. But uh, certain parts of the country are better than others, you know, for goats and that kind of stuff. So uh, that's what that is, is a hog and, or a goat and sheep panel. And then we move into our cattle uh, products. You notice you got a variety of bale feeders. Now, one of the things you need to know about these bale feeders is that some of the coloring are, are about to change. You see the galvanize, and uh, that'll stay the same. But we're about to start color coding our bale feeders. And this is going to be really neat for those of you that have been carrying our bale feeders. We make a great selection of bale feeders. Uh, we're about to start powder coating them instead of dip painting them. And we're going to start that this summer. It'll be ready for this fall season. So uh, sometimes you look at them, you're sitting here looking at these two feeders. They look a lot alike to a yard guy, you know, out in the yard. But these are two different size of feeders. You notice this one down here is made out of 1.9 tubing, and this one's made out of 1 .1 inch and 5 eighths tubing. So if you sell a, an inch and five-eighths economy round bell feeder and he goes out and loads the big one, you just lost money, right? So we're going to color code that so that doesn't happen. We do that with our panels and, and things, so we're going to start doing that here. You also have the skirted options in both. These two on the top right here, of course, are the economy round bell feeders, the RBFT and the RBFT skirted. And then you've got uh, the heavy-duty round bell feeders on the bottom. So you've got a little variety there, and then, of course, you can get it uh, and galvanized for those of you that may live in a coastal area. We sell a lot of galvanized, you know, to those folks. Uh, or some people just like, you know, a galvanized product. So, uh, we also have a, a, a weather vane, a mineral feeder. If you want to, you know, one of the biggest problems with throwing out mineral block, salt block, and that kind of stuff is what? The weather. Rain and all that deteriorates it faster than the, the cattle can get a hold of it. So if you've got mineral in here, 
Uh, this weather vane feeder is designed to go with the wind, you know, to, to cover it, which usually shields the, the elements off of it. And uh, that's gonna, gonna make that where your mineral, your investment's gonna last a lot longer. Very popular item, especially with uh, the cattle folks. Uh, and that's a very sturdy uh, stand. It's pretty heavy duty. You don't want them able to knock it over. That's why we make the base a little bit wider. And uh, all of this is, of course, replaceable poly uh, that we use here. Then you've got a bull feeder. Bulls are coming up. Obviously, you've got, got it protected from the weather. They'll nose it up and get in there and, and get the mineral out of there. And uh, that saturates this top. And uh, when they put their head in there, it keeps the flies off their head and that kind of stuff. So pretty, pretty creative little deal. That's become the most popular one uh, that we sell now. So, uh, but all those being just different types of bull mineral feeders, okay? Uh, good deal. All right, we're gonna move, move on. Everybody just kind of make sure you get in a position where you can see well. Now this is the uh, this is one of the thing this is the kind of the thing that started pre manufacturing right so you've got uh, you saw Marvin Prefort with a head gate today and you can tell that it looks a little different it's got the you know shielded yokes on it and that kind of stuff but overall the operation of this thing hadn't changed since the very first one was built you'll see the first one today. Um, uh, the difference between our head gate and competitor head gates is uh, pretty simple, really. And uh, I'm going to address a couple of how the competitors do it and how we do it and why we think the, this is the easiest head gate to work on the market. All of our cattle equipment is actually advertised as uh, easy on the cow, easy on the cowboy. What we want to do is we want to make this thing so easy uh, for the user to work. I mean, a lot of times when we're doing cattle working demonstrations, I'll pull like a, uh, uh, you know, 12 or 13 year old girl or young man out of the, out of the audience and let them actually come down in front of everybody and work it because it's so simple. It's literally, a lot of them that you see, you know, that one has a fully opening with this particular model opens a full 28 inches, which is more than enough for, for any herd size basically. But you notice that thing opens all the way up without any obstruction. A lot of them that you'll see are, are like scissors, and they'll open up like this, but then the cow has to step over. You've seen those, you know, at the bottom, and a lot of times if they got pressure from another one pushing behind, they'll trip and fall out of there. Another common style, and the most common that we compete against is what we call a swinging door head gate. How many people have seen that or even used one? How many people have used one? Here's, here's what we see as a problem with a swinging door head gate. We could have added one to our mix years ago just to for those that prefer it but here's the problem this head gate right here is a one size fit all i can wherever i stop it's locked we'll talk about the lock mechanism in a minute but wherever that thing ends up it's locked and that cow can't take it away from you it's called an infinite locking system that might be on the deal tomorrow infinite locking system and that's the reason the reason it's called infinite is because it'll lock anywhere it stops there's no limit on that bar so where i can catch a bull and then i can catch a calf and then i can open up and let that one out and catch a mama cow right behind it i can catch any size cow i don't even have to have a tailgate on the back i can just let them go one behind the other and i can release one and catch the other one right off of that one's butt. See what I'm saying? And I don't have to sort my herd. I can catch any size cow, etc. The problem with the swinging door head gates is the fact that you've got a setting for the width. So you've got to look at the size cows you're operating. You've got to set that. And then you've got to cock it in each time. And the cow comes in, sticks his neck through, and it comes to the lock position forward. The problem is no cow has the same size neck. So if it's too loose, they're thrashing around and they're you know, a danger to themselves as well as you. And if it's too tight, then you're choking them out while you're trying to work on them. Either one of those are bad options. That's what we like about this with that infinite lock. It, it always adjusts to that size cow's neck, okay? So then you have to, to let the cow out, you've gotta be able to go forward and then you have to reset it all the way back in. 
Well, so they have to have a tailgate or something to stop the next cow, right? Because they got to come back, lock, release, all the way back in. Whereas mine, all I got to do is lift the lever up and down, okay? So it's really easy to do. I don't have to worry about my settings. I don't have to worry about, a lot of times a cow, if you get it too wide, they'll, they'll slide through and you'll catch them on, especially on that pin bone back there on the hip. And then you've got a mess because you don't have enough power to get the gate open. She's basically stuck. So you have to cut them out or, or whatever happened. A lot of cows get hurt or killed uh, getting stuck in head gates and stuff. Nearly impossible to get stuck in this because it's simply up, catch the next one, up, catch the next one. It's pretty simple. So that's kind of the concept of why we use a fully front opening versus the scissors or or uh, certainly not a swinging door head gate. It's just more productive, faster, safer, cleaner, whole lot easier, okay? This particular model, we offer two models of head gate. We offer model 97 and it doesn't have the automatic feature on here. And then we offer this and it opens 25 inches and then we offer the uh, model 91 and it, uh, it opens a full 28 inches. Notice it has locks on both sides and these are called infinite locks. To release the lock, all you gotta do is that right there, just that little bit of motion releases the lock, okay? This one is uh, automatic. So to set the automatic, cause let's say you're out working cows by yourself and uh, the cow don't wanna, she's gotten shoot sour and so she don't wanna come down the alley cause she knows she's gonna get a shot or something like that. And, uh, or she knows Chad is at the other end of the line down there and she knows what's coming, right, okay? So you wanna have to, if you're all by yourself, let's say you got a cow up and you, you wanna medicate that cow every single day, you're gonna have to catch her on your own. So if they won't come down the alley willingly, you're gonna have to go coax them down the alley. So to do that, you're gonna set this thing in automatic. This, this head gate will catch a cow without you even standing here. And to do that, you're gonna simply reach back and engage the automatic lever, okay? And, and what I've done is I've engaged this rod right here that's attached to the spring. So now when I pull the head gate up, if you'll watch the spring, now it's a little harder to lift because I'm pulling against the spring. I'm setting a mouse trap, basically. So I reach around the front, and I'm gonna set that mouse trap about right there, okay? So you got a little bit of gap here. A cow certainly can't fit through. She can get her head through there, but what's the widest part of her? Shoulders. So she thinks she can get through. So I go back here, and I've got my paddle or hot shot or whatever. I'm running her through there. She sees that hope opening, and she says, oh, yeah, I can fit through there, no problem. I've, I've been losing a little weight lately, and all 1,400 pounds of her comes crashing into this head gate, right? So she gets her head through. And when she does, she separates these yokes just ever so slightly, okay, with her shoulders. And when she does, this gravity latch falls, okay? Now she can't open it because the lock's doing its job, right? Okay? So when she can't go forward, she kind of settles down and slides back. And when she does, that spring pulls that comfortably right down on the smallest part of her neck, okay? So this thing, uh, will catch cows whether you're standing there or not. It's a pretty slick little deal. We're one of the only companies that'll actually set our automatic and demonstrate it at big cattle working demonstrations where there's 10 or 12 shoots out there because it just doesn't ever fail. Now these aren't designed for horn cattle, obviously, because horn cattle can't, they're gonna go through and they have to work their head through. But uh, any questions about the chute or the head gate? We also, we're so confident in these locks and you want to make sure on your yard you take take that off so the next customer doesn't come up and go, ooh, that's too hard to work, okay? Because it's real easy like it is now, but that spring makes it harder. <clears throat> uh, we're so confident in these locks that uh, we replace them for free. They have a lifetime guarantee. So if the lock ever fails, we have a lifetime guarantee. So you want to remember that. It might be like a true or false question. You know, you never know. Uh, now, the other thing is, and we'll demonstrate this tomorrow down at the cattle pens, but uh, sometimes you got to work on a cow. Let's say they got a cyst on their eye or you want to work on their ears or something like that. You want to be able to hold that animal down. 
Well, a lot of companies use a bar. It's kind of a one size fits all deal and they take that bar and wrap it over their head, but they still can thrash a little bit. We think the best way to handle any animal is with a halter. Think about it. Now, what do you do with show cows? Halter, horses, what do you do? Halter. So what we did was we, we made a halter out of chain. Basically what you do is you reach around here, the cow's head's down in here. I'm gonna pull this up over her nose like this. So her nose is under here. And then I'm gonna go over the top of her head. I'm gonna pull her tight with this chain. I'm gonna suck her down. So now her head is tucked like this. I'm going over the top of her head. And now what I've got is this is over her head, this is over her nose, and I've got her sucked down tight so I'm safe. So now I can work on her without fear of her thrashing or hurting her me or herself. Anybody got any questions about that? This is just a basic little working alley that you see right here. This is kind of a typical starting point. Here's the great thing about these modular systems. If you build in something in permanent, you're kind of stuck with it or you got to tear it out and add to it. Portable panels are fantastic from the standpoint of you can expand. Like you can start with 10 cows and just get you a little working alley like this with like a a no back alley stop in here. This is to keep the cows, they come underneath it. That falls down behind them so they can't back out. But you can start with something as simple as this and then add a 90 degree sweep, 180 degree sweep, holding pins, the whole shooting match. So you can start small and add to it, which a lot of people do. You notice too that this is a uh, head gate stand. And this stand is actually sold separately. Don't sell it with the head gate because you just gave away a few hundred bucks, okay? But the, but the stand is sold separately, and this is a great way to build a very inexpensive uh, working alley for somebody with a small herd. All right, next thing we're going to look at is the calf table. So basically the calf table works like this. You're going to take the calf table. You're normally going to set it at the end of an alley or more preferably at the end of the head gate or a squeeze chute. You're gonna, this works up to 450 pound calves. You're gonna bring the calf down through the chute. As soon as the calf comes through, you're gonna pull that shut. Now this, this one is not an infinite lock. This is a friction lock, okay? It's a little bit different. It's a friction lock. This table has three settings on it. So you can, depending on the size of calf you works, you got three settings on the uh, floor width down here. So the cow comes in, calf comes in, I'm going to pull that shut and as I'm doing so I'm tilting the calf. Now her weight or his weight is going to bring her easily to me. So now I'm standing there with the calf. I've got total access to the animal so if I want to take out these rods which we have wired in here uh, I can remove these, these uh, rods so I can access to the animal. I've got a hawk chain back here on the back. If I'm castrating, I can pull his leg back, put it in here in the chain notch, castrate the calf. I've got a built-in medicine tray there on the other side if I'm working from that side. And uh, so pretty much got this animal. Now what you don't want to do is you notice this thing doesn't tilt to a full 90. That's one common mistake in calf tables. The reason is because animals will fight unless they can get their feet on the ground. You know, like, you know how a cat does or whatever? Calves are the same way. If you want a calf to relax while it's in this table, let his feet be on the ground. Let him have a little bit of pressure on the ground. If you turn him all the way on his side where his feet are not, he doesn't have a firm grip, he'll fight and kick. So that's the reason we don't tilt it all the way to a 90 degree angle. Then when I'm done with him, I'm stand him up. I'm going to release the friction lock by pushing down. I'm going to, oh, i got to release, squeeze first, and then I'm going to release him right through the front. It's a real simple deal. Just the best way in the world to work calves. Safe. We also have a lock down here on the bottom. If you don't want, if you want to just catch them and work them without flipping them, you can do that too. You can just pull the squeeze manually like that. So, very simple to operate but uh, a very, very effective tool for calves. We have three different chutes that are sitting here for you. We have the S01, and you can also make this a S0191 by putting that 91 head gate on the front of this. 
We've got the SO4 and we've got the SC13. Basically what you've got right here is you've got a small, medium, and large, or baby bear, mama bear, papa bear, okay? Depending on the size of the herd, uh, the amount of features that you want, uh, those kind of things. So this is a small one. This is the smallest chute. And, it, and when I say small, it usually means herd size, not animal size. We've put some big animals. We've had 1,800 pound bulls in this thing. And if you've got stuff heavier than that, then go ahead and buy the big one if you want to. This one's uh, quite a bit less expensive. It has less whistles and bells. These other two right here I'm going to show you have all kinds of working mechanisms. This one's a little bit simpler, so we're going to start here with this one. One thing about a prefert uh, is that we don't want a bunch of ropes, pulleys, head knocking levers, you know, guillotine gates, those kind of things. We want everything to slide, do the, do the work of the chute for you. This one doesn't have a big fancy tailgate. It's got just a simple slide tailgate. You just manually pull that out like so. Uh, it works like this. You're going to open it up. Y'all will be doing this tomorrow. All of you will get an opportunity to. Open it up. Cow sticks her head through. Catch. And you're going to pull the squeeze in on them. All of it's just right here. Notice you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to run all over the chute. Everything's right here uh, where you need it. Uh, all of our chutes have five contoured drop down sides on both sides. So if I need access to the animal to vaccinate, if I need to do branding, whatever I need to do, I've got access to it. And you notice that the sides are not straight like they are with some chutes. The reason for that is the cow's not straight, right? The cow's round. So we're going to contour kind of around the, the, the girth of the cow, okay? It's kind of like if I held a basketball like this with a straight side and told you to knock it out of my hands, it'd be easy for you to do. But if I cupped it, then it's not as easy for that to go down. You don't want those cows squatting down in the chute, so you don't want to wedge them. Okay, you want to hold them. You want to support them. Uh, we also do removable sides on both sides. That whole side will come completely out. I've got total access to this animal from one end to the other. If I'm working on her for mastitis or foot rot, uh, any of those kind of things, uh, I've got total access. Some of them, you know, do it in panels. We don't do that because if you reach in here and had half a panel and that cow kick, she'll break your arm. So we remove the entire bottom. Sometimes you want to let a calf nurse on a cow, that kind of thing. That gives you total access to that uh, as well. All of them have slam latches, so they're easy to put back together. Now this one to adjust the floor is a, uh, a little more tedious but we've taken a lot of them have pins down in the bottom you got to get down there in the mud and beat the pins up and that kind of thing we we uh got rid of the pins and put slide rods in there so if i want to widen it for bigger cattle i just slide the front out drop it down in there and we're good to go now i'm ready for bigger animals bring mama cow or whatever in there. I'm ready to, to do that. Uh, all of our chutes are equipped with side exits. Side exits are, are primarily used for sorting cows that are open, like when you're trying to preg check. And also if the cow gets down and is in an emergency situation and they're stuck down there, we just got a simple rope return. No mechanisms on it. This is about as stripped down a chute as we make right here. This is the economy chute, if you will. Everything's kind of manual. Now as we step up, things are gonna start getting a little more automatic. You notice we got a preg cage back here on the back. Uh, that can be attached to any preferred chute. Just allows the vet to go in and preg check. A lot of people preg check just like this from the side. They don't even go behind them. But if they do, we've got a uh, preg cage back there, okay? Now, this chute is called the SO4. This chute right here is about 60% of our sales, and the other chutes uh, all split uh, the, the other 40%. This is, this is our number one selling chute, and it is a humdinger. I mean, there is a lot of whistles and bells on this chute. First of all, you'll notice that we took out the carriage a while ago. Each of our chute, uh, we have axles that you can mount on the bottom of them, and all of them are portable. 
You put about 12 pounds of pressure in the tires, you can pull them 70 miles an hour down the highway. Okay? All these chutes, all these chutes have a carriage. And, uh, and like I said, you pull them just like a utility trailer. Okay? Uh, this particular chute uh, is our best selling chute. It's got the 91 head gate on it. We've already talked about the differences with the head gate. Just, and it's got the drop down, you know, sidebars, five on each side, gravity latch, five contour drop sides might be on the thing tomorrow. How many, how many on each side? There's five, there's 10 total, okay? So if I say how many total are on a chute, it'd be 10, five per side, very good. It's also got removable bottoms on both sides. Uh, where this one gets really cool is one operator can stand literally in one place, not take one step, and do every function on the chute. So literally, I can stand right here, I can open the back tailgate, let that cow in, catch her, close the gate, and do the squeeze, everything is right here. It's like once you get used to it, you're kind of like a one-man band, you know, the guy playing the drum and the tambourine and all that. So it's real easy. Then when I'm done, release the squeeze, let the cow out, go to the next one. Now a lot of times when we're working cows, depending on what we're doing, we'll leave the tailgate open the whole time because we have a preferred head gate. And there's a lot of companies that buy these and put them on their chutes because the head gate works so well. Uh, we'll leave the tailgate open, we'll stand there, catch the cow, release the cow, catch the next one, we just let them stack up in the alley because it's this is really not that big a deal. So uh, same thing here, we've got the automatic. Reach up here, set it. I go back here, open the tailgate, let the cow in, close the tailgate. She'll come up, separate the yolks, gravity latch falls, boom, caught, okay? A uh, couple of other things that are a little different. I got a side exit here, simply pull the rope, and that releases it. On this one, instead of having a rope return, I've got a lever return. So I reach right here, pull the lever, it's closed. Uh, if I've got a guy helping me, he can work this adjustment back here and work the tailgate in the back. It's kind of out of my way. The coolest feature, I think, on this chute is uh, it always takes a little while, especially when you get mud and manure and that kind of stuff in a chute to adjust the sides. They get a little rigid, you know. Bill Prefer wanted the chute to be able to adjust instead of two or three minutes, he wanted it in two or three seconds. And we're like, man, that's impossible, there's no way. And then he designed the, the, the floating floor width adjustment. All you gotta do to adjust the side of this chute, pull this lever down, the whole side comes up and I can move it in and I'm done. So now I'm ready for calves, okay? Let's say daddy's right behind him, okay? Now all I gotta do is pull it up, whoop. Pull it up. Now I'm back to my widest width. Let's say mama's coming next. Go, go in the middle. It's real simple, the floor just swings, you use your foot, put it in the right hole, you're ready to go. Uh, very, very fast, there's not another chute on the market that does anything even close to this. But let's say that uh, this is a common problem with chutes. Let's say I'm working calves, and uh, so I've got it set down here real narrow. Look what happens when you open your tailgate on any chute in the country. I open my tailgate, now I've got two holes for that calf to go through there. You see that? That's a problem, because sometimes they'll go in the chute, sometimes they try to shoot out. So you got people that put boards here, and some people stand here and try to you know, direct them in there. Bill came up with a pretty good idea. We use a split tailgate. So if you use one of those roll-up tailgates, like a lot of them use, you can't do this. <coughs> but uh, Bill put a pin in the linkage system. You pull that pin, and now when you open the tailgate, only one side opens. So now you just right down to just the calf width. When you're ready to be done, slam it shut, put the, tip, the pin in here. I'm glad Chip's not here right now. 
He'd be wearing me out, wouldn't he? No. Yeah, that was that was appropriate. That's funny. You you think you could have reached it? Maybe, yeah, maybe. So, uh, and now you're back to fully function. You know, same thing. So, that's how that works. All right. This one is the big boy. This is called the SC13. Now, you guys notice these blinders on here. Anybody know what those are for? It's for, you know, cattle that shoot sour that don't want to come down there. You literally, if you put these blinders on and open them up, you can stand there by the handle all day long and they're not going to see you, basically. And they're not going to be afraid of you, so they'll come up and come through the chute. You can notice this chute is a lot bigger. It's got a lot of the same features. You got the, how many drop downs on each side? How many total? Ten. How many bottom drop downs? Two, one on each side. Okay. Um, this one, we did a couple of things a little different. We remodeled the head gate a little bit. So this one's called an HG10, a head gate 10. That's the year that it came out. It pretty much works the same way. It's got a little bigger frame to meet the bigger chute. These things right here, these are neck extenders, okay? And these do not come standard. You bolt these on after the fact, okay, these neck extenders. We'll just put these on here to demonstrate that we had them, okay? Uh, we simplified some things on this particular chute. Uh, put a solid bar on the tailgate. We're like, Bill, this bar is kind of in the way. What are we going to do about it? You know, we kind of got to go under it. And he said, that's no problem. And he made it where the bar slid up out of the way. Pretty simple little deal. But yeah, and then when you're done, you just slide it down and open it, open it back up. Very simple solution. Instead of having the lever over here, we just made it a knob. There's a knob adjustment here, whether we set... Uh, that's how you set, made it a little easier to set basically the mouse trap, if you will. Okay, or you can take it off. Now it's free flowing by itself. Uh, the adjustment for the floor is the same. Uh, the return is basically the same. If I release it the front, return it here off the side. The only thing we did, we beefed up the tailgate quite a bit. These are for guys that really have some pretty big and pretty rank cattle, okay? That SO4 will, will suit anybody's needs. But if somebody says, oh, I got the biggest cattle in the world, I've got big Simmental and they're long and all this, this chute is actually, uh, I think, eight inches longer than that other chute, okay? It's bigger, it's got more cubic uh, inches in it, so it's just a, a bigger chute all the way around. A little heavier. A little more robust, still has the same locking mechanisms on the side, uh, but this has been a good seller for us. We just came out with it a few years ago and it's, it's done well. If you're going to stock a chute in your yard, you want the SO4 for sure, uh, followed by the SO1. This one I would recommend that you special order for people that want, you know, really need a big chute. It's quite a bit more expensive, it's got a lot of stuff on it. Uh, same thing happens if you've got, you've got the gap when you're working calves. The only thing that it, they did instead of having to get up there for short people like me and pull the pin, okay, is, uh, and by the way, I'm average height. You, the rest of you guys are just a bunch, y'all are a bunch of circus freaks. That's what's wrong with the rest of you. Uh, instead of having a pin to pull, it's basically just a, uh, a button. So in other words, if I want to disengage it i reach up there just like on the head gate and now when i pull it just one side works okay and then to re-engage it you just punch that back in and now both sides work again so it's just a few more whistles and bells you know as you step up in dollars you get a few more conveniences this one's like fifteen hundred dollars more at retail yeah but you know if somebody's got big big cattle I mean, I think they got to have the biggest one in the big tailgate, but SO4 will do 95% of everything that's out there. Yeah, those things are kind of cool, man. We don't we don't make these, we buy them, and, and they just pop right off like so. And you just take them over here. I mean, they just install in a second. Just pop it on, and you're good to go. If you get in there and look, when you flap them out, the cat, you can't see me standing there. Uh, 
<laughs> You're the meanest class I've ever had. All right. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about cattle panels. You notice we got panels across the other side of the room, and then we've got panels on this side of the room, okay? And the reason these are over here, they're duplicated in both places, is because I want to demonstrate to you that these are uh, designed for cattle. We've got some, uh, and mostly the thing that determines that a lot of times is height, and the other thing that determines it is what? Is what? Strength, gauge, the gauge of steel, okay? These are 16 gauge panels. This one right here is called an arena panel. It's a full uh, two inch panel. It's got our rodeo pin connectors. This is the exact panel that they use in the PBR, the NFR, all those, all those operations. We've got a lot of people that, that uh, use this stuff and it's quite a bit more expensive than the other ones but they like to use this for their cattle working systems. They want something really big, really beefy. It's really a little bit overkill for most people, but if that's what they want, by golly, we'll sell them what they want, okay? So this is an arena panel. This next one right here is a brand new panel. Uh, you notice how it's the same exact features, same gauge, same everything as this panel. This is a real popular panel that you guys sell a bunch of. It's called the Premier Panel. You guys have sold Kajillions of them. This is a 64 inch panel. The rail on this panel is, is called quadriform. That's definitely on the test. Quad, quadriform tubing. That's because it's got four sides. It's not an oval, it actually has a flat side. The reason we use that design is because it has memory. Like if you get a bunch of cows in a pen and you put 200 cows putting pressure on it, it'll, it'll bend out and then it'll come back. Where a round tube would crease, this one actually flexes and gives, okay? And we've actually had them where it flexed so much it bent and didn't come back. It didn't, it didn't remember and come back. You can lay these things on the ground and run over them with a tractor or a truck or anything else, straighten them right back out and put them back in the line. Very, very, very versatile panel. Probably the best thing we build actually for the money. Uh, 64 inches tall, comes with a chain connector. Why do we use chain connectors? Yeah. It's much more convenient and it's safer. If you're chaining panel, if you're pinning panels together, you got a little foot trap in here, right? You got a gap, the horse can get a leg in there. When you use chain connectors, you got them tight. Nothing can get in there because you're panel to panel. So the, the answer for this, and it is on the test, is safety and convenience. It's convenient because I can hook it up to anything. I can hook it to a post. I can hook it to any competitor panel, a gate, a tree. I can hook it to the middle of another panel. I mean, a chain will go around anything. So basically, it's very convenient, okay? It just makes sense. And then the fact that it, no foot trap makes it safer. So safety and convenience. It's a 16 gauge panel. Now, one thing we do, nobody in the industry does, is we use drilled stays. Y'all are gonna see this process over there today. Uh, but we drill holes through every one of these rails, okay? And then we take this rod and we run it through the, each of the rails in the, in the jig. And then we weld all the way around it. Well, that does a couple of things. One, you get a better paint job. A lot of them use that Z brace. Y'all seen that? Or they use a flat stray, like a strap. Uh, we, this is much stronger. We're welding all the way around, top and bottom. You get better paint coverage because the paint can get all the way around it. There's no areas the, the powder can't reach. But the main thing it does <coughs> is provides tremendous amount of strength, both horizontal pressure and vertical pressure. Animal gets up on top of this panel, you've got every one of these rails tied together. So they all are, it's like a house. When you first started putting all the stuff up, it's real flimsy and you gotta be careful, but once they tie it all together, boom, each, each board pulls on the next, that's what we're doing with these rails, making each one of these rails strengthen the next. And we're able to do that because that's a solid tube run all the way through each of those rails. So this is the premier panel. This one comes in a variety of sizes because we build cattle working systems. So you got six through 16 in increments of two. Six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. This is a new panel. Notice it's got a pin connection, a little different, okay? 
Notice it's taller. It's a full 72 inches where this is 64. This was the panel and that, uh, that they like to use for like the Mustang adoption program and that kind of stuff. They'll use that because they got to have a six foot tall panel when you're breaking Mustangs. So this is popular for that. But a lot of people are really starting to like them for cattle working systems that want that extra height. So you've got an either or situation. The only thing is for right now, we only make this one in a 12 footer. It's kind of a specialty panel. Now it may grow to other sizes later, but for now it's a 12 foot panel. The fish hook design that you see on both of these designs is actually a safety feature as well as a strength feature. Instead of bending, when you bend a bed frame, you know most panels have that bed frame bend in it. When you bend a panel like that, it actually compromises the corner a little bit because you're putting a bend in it. Whereas right here, what we've done is we've actually strengthened it. We're going up and above and we're getting a weld here and here. We've actually made this corner stronger. We've put more steel in it, okay? The best part about this, and a lot of people don't have a clue what this is for, when you're in a round pin environment, especially when you're starting colts and those kind of things, they tend to want to get out of the round pin, right? So they jump up on top of the panel and they'll lose their balance. You ever watch old horse get up here? They don't just pull straight down. They, they tend to do this number and walk down it. We don't want to funnel them down into a bed frame style and get their leg caught right here. You see what the, how that happens? So what this does is two things. Number one, it serves as a stop. So now they can pull off or it serves as a ramp, one over this one and then the next one that's here, and then they can pull off, okay? But they're not gonna go down. That's the worst thing that can happen in a round pen is for a horse to get, get a leg down in here because then they're gonna, you know, a cow will get caught up. Y'all ever see them? They'll just stand there and wait on you to come cut them out or whatever. A horse loses it. They'll break a leg in a heartbeat. So you've got to prevent that. So the chain is, what's the two reasons for this? Safety, Safety and convenience. What's the fish hook for? Safety and strength. Safety and strength, okay. We use, this is called a, what kind of stay, do you remember? Drilled stay, and what kind of tubing is it? Quadriform tubing, okay. Uh, and what does that do for us? Makes it flexible, it's a little stronger. What gauge, anybody remember what gauge all three of these are? 16 gauge. You get them in gray because that denotes strength, okay. Any questions about these panels? You guys are fast learners. We're gonna kick their butt tomorrow. Um, all right, we'll move on to, uh, there's a few items inside here that I'll just point out for you. We've got some bob wire decoilers that fit in the back of a truck. You can see that. You know, you just hook this up basically right in the back of your vehicle and you can spool it that way and go in the back of a four-wheeler or whatever. We also have a manual bob wire decoiler. I recommend getting these. Uh, they make great Mother's Day presents or anniversary presents. And then we've got two different size of uh, T-post drivers. T-post drivers. One thing that we do, and you, you might think, well, gosh, a T-post driver is a T-post driver, right? We do a couple of things that, that are a little different that helps you out ergonomically, okay? One thing that we do is you notice the size of that tube right there. You know, a lot of T-posts, those cheap ones, have the little rods. That was designed by somebody that's never driven T-posts. Because if when you hit a T-post with that little rod, man, it, it hurts. I mean, it, it does not feel good. So what we do is we give you a little bit of substance, okay, to absorb the vibration. So you've really got a good grip on that instead of holding on that little rod, okay? The other thing that we do, you'll notice this is pulled in toward me. That's because I got more power, more strength in closer to my body than I do when I'm way out here. So we don't put the wings on the side, we put the handles inverted toward the, toward the user. And so those are little things. I like the 30 pounder best because you're obviously less wax, you know, but uh, pins, on your, pins on your motivation. Now, this is a popular item that we've sold to some of the biggest kennels in the country. This is the Prefort Dog Kennel. Now this literally, you know, we have items like bunk feeders and round bell feeders and it's kind of a me too item. You know, it's one of those, they got one, I got one, yeah. You know, my powder coat may be a little better, blah, blah, blah. One thing, and this is the question on the test, is how, what tools are required to put together a Prefort Kennel? None. All we got are these little 
clips right here. So you take the clip out. It's a three-way clip. The reason it's three-way is if you're making a run, you can come right off the side there. So you can literally put this kennel together. You know, a 10 by 10 kennel like this would take about four or five minutes to put up. Real simple. Clips in the bottom, clips in the top, you're done. Okay. We use a two before non-climb uh, wire. And one thing we do different is we actually weld each wire to the frame. Most people will run that, you know, one long section and they'll tack it about every 12 inches or something like that. We tack every single wire all the way around that whole kennel. It takes a lot of extra time and work, but it makes it a lot stronger. And it also prevents what's called a powder coat Faraday cage. There's a, there's a powder coat is applied electrostatically and it's kind of like putting two negative ends of a magnet together. You know how it pushes each other around. Same thing with this. If you push powder into a place where there's a crack or a crevice, it pushes the powder out. It's because it's electromagnetically magnetically applied. So uh, it's, it's a pretty electrostatically, it pushes it out. The static pushes it out. So we weld each wire so we get optimum paint coverage. And this is a, the reason this kennel is so expensive is, number one, it's a galvanized tube underneath here, okay? Then on top of it, it's got that architectural grade of powder coat. So it's basically two of the best coverages you can buy. If you just had one or the other, it's not going to last you as long. We have a double coat right here. We've got galvanized tube with a powder coat overcoat lockable door we've got a stop at the top you can leave it out or put it in you can go either direction or if you've got an aggressive dog i can't do it in here because i've got a top on this one you can put put this in like so and when the dog comes to jump on the, the gate you know like your little kids or whatever they can't knock the the gate back you have to be able to open in see it won't go in i can reverse it and do it the other way as well weld every single wire. We do a lot of little things, like we roll the bottoms underneath here. That's not just a sheared pipe. If you were to feel underneath there, you can't cut yourself. You're not, I can take my boot and run it across there. Not gonna cut it. We roll that because we don't want any sharp edges for uh, dogs to get hurt in. Again, this is a uh, eight gauge wire, very heavy duty. Uh, this is just a really good kennel. This is a 10 by 10. You see that we have a top uh, available for it. You can put it out. We got people that keep monkeys in this thing. We've got people that keep exotic birds in it. There's even a traveling group that puts tigers in them and have, keeps tigers in these kennels. Uh, so uh, this is the most common seller, a five by 10. And uh, then the 10 by 10 would be second, but we've also got a bunch of other sizes like four by eights and four by four and eight by eight and all that other stuff. Any questions about the kennels? The big deal with this is, if I said true or false, this has a galvanized undercoat, what would it be? True. true. Okay. And what kind of powder coat do we use? Ar architectural grade. That's the kind you want to remember, architectural grade. Okay. Now we're in the gates. Uh, several different kind of gates. Uh, this one that I've got my hand on right here is the Ponderosa gate. Basically, it goes with that fence right there. And the idea behind this gate is that these rails are spaced at the same spacing that those rails and that fence are. And what happens, I've got it at my place. I had a guy yesterday that was working for me, and we're out there working around the place, and he goes, I've never noticed this was a gate because it looks just like the fence. It's right in line from post to post. You can't hardly tell that there's a gate there. It's, it's that in line. So uh, these are Ponderosa gates. That's a 1.9 tubing there. Of course, the powder coat set up. And then we have a variety of gates for you to choose from. This first gate right here is an old tried and true one, but it's kind of making a kind of going away because of the bull gate. This is a uh, premier corral gate. And this gate has been popular for many years. It's made out of uh, 1.9 tubing, basically two inch. Okay. 16 gauge, heavy duty. This is for crowding conditions. Uh, got the drilled stays and that kind of thing. But it's kind of going away. It's being replaced a little bit by the two inch bull gate. You notice we've got a, a galvanized 
uh, bull gate and we've got a powder coated bull gate. This gate right here is what I've put uh, mostly on, on my place when I, where I don't have the Ponderosa. That is a fantastic gate. You're talking about a two inch gate. You're talking about 16 gauge, heavy duty. The best part is we're even, we went down a little bit last year in price. Our buying power with steel has gotten better and better and better. And we're fixing to take a pretty significant decrease again on this two inch gate right here. So this is a fantastic buy. It's a great gate uh, for the money. I mean, this is, this is my favorite gate that we sell is that two inch bull gate. Very, very good gate. The next two gates that we got here, these are called D gate, D gates. The reason is for kind of the shape of the tubing kind of looks like a, a D. That's where it literally got its name. It's the only gate that we have that has a mitered corner. You notice that there's no rounded edge. It actually has a nice, a lot of people like this for like an entrance gate up at the front of their house. It's very decorative, that kind of thing. And notice we have a wire field gate. We have a standard six rail gate. And uh, both of these have been very popular over the years. We've sold them for many, many years. Uh, both gates really, really nice. Uh, that mitered corner is welded all the way around. Uh, you just don't see many gates like this. You'll see some of those that are square, but it's where they've T-boned into the side and you've got the little stub sticking up. You don't see, I, I don't know of anybody else that builds one of these with a mitered corner. So, uh, then we come down here and uh, these are our high volume gates right here. Now this two inch gate is very high, high volume, but these are the ones that really are what you're selling the most of. You got a galvanized version and a galvanized wire field, and then you've got the most common, you've got the powder coat with the powder coat wire field. Now that is our most popular seller. That's our, our economy uh, gate, okay? That's, uh, that's the one that you look at on truckloads and there's hundreds of them going down the highway. We sell them hundreds at the time, and uh, that's gonna be your most common seller. It comes in red and green, those are your two color options. That'll probably be on the test tomorrow, red or green on economy gates. I'll probably say something like what uh, two colors are economy gates and panels available in? And you would say red, red and green, okay? And if you want to be really smart and you can remember it and say, well, Jeff, they primarily come in red and green, but there's also a galvanized option. That would really, <laughs> that would really that would really make uh, Chip's team look ignorant, and I would love that, all right? Not because of his team looking ignorant, but, you know, yeah. it's the obvious, okay? So a friendly competition makes everybody better, right? Mm -hmm. You guys are fantastic listeners, by the way. I really appreciate your attention today and all this. I think you're really absorbing it. We're going to go back through and do a little review at the end, about 10 or 15-minute review, but you guys are doing great. So we got our Ponderosa gate. Why is it so short? Matches the rails. You got the Premier Corral gate. This is an old tried and true. What gauge is this? 16. 16. It's a heavy duty gate. You got the Bull gate, and that one's taking the place of this one pretty much. It's what gauge? 16. Heavy duty. Got the what kind of stays? Drilled. Drilled stays. Why don't we call them drilled stays? You're drilling through the rails, right? Right through there. This is called what? And it gets its uh, shape or its name from its what? shape okay uh then these are the economy panels and they're available in what two colors Red, or, okay i love it now listen you guys have got to pick the five y'all need to elect a team captain on this group but we need to pick y'all got to pick your your top five folks in this group to go up against them tomorrow okay so all women's team i'm comfortable with that i am i think that's a great idea that's a good idea. Put the pressure on the ladies. I think they. I think this group of ladies. I can tell they're. They know what they're talking about. So that's good. He just says that because women are smarter. Yeah. Well, we all know that. That's an obvious. Okay. This is a Ponderosa fence, folks. This is not something you're gonna. You can get a display and put in your store if you like. This is not something you're gonna stock a lot of. Obviously, you're gonna take an order. And man, we sell miles and miles and miles of this. This is the easy sale. It's a great product. You notice it's got the solid post as well as the, these are six inch dome posts. They're treated. They're expected to last about 30 years. 
architectural grade powder rail so you've got the aesthetics and country look of the wood post but you've got the strength of a, of a pipe rail it's fantastic this is the easiest fence i've ever built in my life this is literally the simplest fence you've ever put in have you ever put some in mm -mm. it is so easy think about what you're doing you go around and you pop the holes about every 10 feet i say about because it don't have to be exact pop them 10 feet put a little mark on the ground set your post in concrete at the right height run a string once the posts are all set, you take the rails, and I don't care if you've got two miles of it, you can do it in a day with a little bit of help because you're running 14 foot length of tube through the holes and they swedge together. Uh, well, we don't have a swedge in this setup, do we? We're supposed to. They swedge, so you can't even tell where the seams are in these posts because one is smaller than the other and they just swedge right in and it's, man, it looks slick. Then on the, termin on the corner post, you've got these little receivers. You see that's right here? And then you slide, you cut the post off to the length, slide it on the receiver, and boom, you're done. I mean, so, so simple to install it. It looks fantastic. I've got about 3,000 feet of this around my place and was putting up some more this weekend. These are seven and a half foot tall. You put them in the ground about two feet. Notice how they flare on the outside around here. What that does is it allows this fence to, to roll with the terrain. So literally, you're going around hills. You can even do corners. We can do 100-foot uh, radius corners uh, around, and that uh, allows that fence to literally flow without. So you don't want it to look choppy, you know, like, like this. You want it to just flow with the land, and that's what those do. But uh, so, so simple. Uh, no connection pieces needed like you would have on a standard fence. It's just a real cool product. So. We love it. It's one of our favorite products right there. This is the uh, Laminator Saw. Uh, this limb saw is a cool little deal. If you buy two of these and put in your store, <laughs> we give you this display kit. You'll get like a, you'll get a TV, the little stand, and all. You can set this whole thing up just like you see it here, and put it in your store so you'll have a demonstration. And we've got some customers really doing well with this. It is. A, you have one in your store. People get, and this is a two thousand dollar product, but boy, if you got, you got to have the display to, to sell them though. Oh, if you yeah. don't have it, you can't sell it out of the box. But this is a neat saw. Basically, you're going to take this, this uh, plate, this uh, what would you call this receiver? Thank you. You know how it is when your tank gets tangled, and uh, you'll mount it to your tractor bucket or your forks or whatever. And then that slides down inside here and pins in. And now what you've done is you've, you've not only taken the height of your bucket, but you can reach eight feet beyond the bucket height. So you can get on up there pretty high with a lot of those buckets, you know, 20, 20 plus feet. And you can see the, <coughs> the difference and see how fast it cuts through that, that uh, log. I mean, man, it makes short work. You get on here with a skid steer or a tractor or whatever, and I mean, you can make short work of trimming trees. I just cleaned up 100 acres uh, around our place. And I'm going to tell you something, trimming trees is not fun, but this job, this deal right here can really make it uh, entertaining. The other way, obviously, is crawling on ladders, putting a guy that you don't like in the bucket, lifting him up there. Uh, I actually did that the other day, and I had my brother up in the, on the forks with a chainsaw. And I accidentally popped the clutch, a little PTO there, and uh, nearly broke his ribs. I mean, he fell, and he whined like a little girl about it, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, he, he, he had a little scratch. I mean, you know, he'll be here tonight, by the way. You guys, he'll be helping my mom. So y'all make sure when you go up to him tonight, say, oh, did you hurt your ribs? Do that to him tonight. Watch your ribs, all right? Ask him about it. He'll tell this big dramatic story about how he nearly died and all this, you know. Is he bigger than you? Uh, he's about the same size. Yeah. <laughs> but I could whip him like nothing. I mean, you know, it's not a problem. Uh, he's, he's my younger brother, but this makes really short work of, of uh, limbs. So this is a great tool. I mean, I believe in it. It runs, the motor is actually a, high, it's a hydraulic saw. So you hook it up into your PTO, and that's how you engage it uh, on your tractor. So you can run it in forward or reverse so you don't get stuck. So the chain doesn't get pinched. If it gets pinched, you just run it the other direction. So the weight of the saw just cuts right through it. 
it is a real neat little product. You can see he's up there pretty, pretty good. And the other thing is you're a good safe distance away. Uh, same brother, uh, a guy reached up and pulled one of the limbs he was cutting, a pretty big limb like that. And uh, you see that right there, that reenactment. That how many people have done that in their in their life? That's some good acting right there. Look at that. I even made the chain come off. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. Look at that. Stuck. This is a good little product. So you guys get an opportunity to put one of those in your store. If you order two, you're going to get the whole display unit just like you see it, and then you got another one to go, and then you can reorder them, you know, as they go. Great ring up right there. Now this is some fun stuff right here. We're into the, I, I told you guys this morning on the slideshow about the rope and shoots. Now this happens to be the RC uh, 98M. This shoot kind of revolutionized uh, some of the roping industry. This is the one that everybody uses. You see it in every backyard. Uh, you see it at all the major competitions. USTRC, World Series, the Prefort World Series, uh, the Ultimate Calf Open Championships, the Wrangler, the Bob Feist, the George Strait, you name it, every big roping uses a Prefort chute. Every major facility around the country uses a Prefort chute. Every major rodeo, including the, all the way up to the Super Bowl, the NFR uses a Prefort chute. It's just the most dominant product that we make. Uh, this particular one, uh, it's a very simple model. Basically, you, you can control it from horseback. You notice everything's up here on, on the sides where the healer or the header can, can operate. The tailgate, it's a simple scissor style tailgate uh, to release uh, the steer. You simply pull, uh, pull down on the lever. That releases it to return it. Pull it back. It's locked in position and ready to go. Few things that have made ours uh, so popular is one, it's durability. These things take a lot of runs, a lot of runs, a lot of runs, a lot of abuse. It's a very durable chute. But there's also some adjustments on here, some little small things that ropers really like. We've got this adjustment here. If you'll notice at the top, <coughs> that I can adjust if I don't want my gate, you don't want your horses keying off of sound, right? When you're a roper, the last thing you want your horse keying off of is movement or sound. You want him to go off your cue, okay? So we, we built the score chute, and I'm going to explain that a little bit more when I get over there. But basically, we've got, uh, we've got it set up to where you can take, and we've got these brakes where I can dial these in a little bit, and if this thing's opening too wild or too fast, if I want it to open slower, I can adjust these brakes down where when that, that cylinder slides through there, it's going to catch more friction. It's not going to just free fall and gate slam open. It'll catch friction on those brakes and open slower and, and, and quieter. And we do a few other little things here. You notice this little piece right here on the header side. Uh, that way, if, there, if he takes his first sling right here, swing right here, he's going to ramp his rope off the top because we all know that headers are whiners. Eric Dunn back there. Y'all know the difference between uh, a team roper and a puppy? Yeah. Eventually the puppy quits whining. You ever heard of that? A little tid, little roper joke for you. Any ropers in the group? All right, good deal. We just hired two ropers. What have I done? What have we done? Good God. Uh, so anyway, this chute right here is just, it is just the most popular thing uh, going down the road, the most dominant in the industry. We also make a staging section that sits right behind it so you can keep one steer on deck. And then we've got this uh, alley system. You, you notice that this thing is, is uh, narrow at the bottom. It's got the uh, support structures on the side to keep it from bending out. But these lead up alleys are very popular. We make them where you can get a 90 degree turn so you can come down the return alley over here on this side make a 90, pull them through a sweep system or however you have it set up, do a 90 degree turn and then bring them right into the lead up alley. These come in eight foot sections and uh, right into the chute. So it's very fast for production. A lot of these production ropers, ropings are going around the clock. Man, they rope all night long, literally. Thousands of teams. 
And this is uh, the chute they use because it's fast, it's productive, it's reliable, it's durable. You're gonna get the same every time. Do you normally put a gate on the back when you're staging on that path? A gate? Oh, you mean like a no back alley stop? No, not normally. They normally just pile up on each other. Once you've uh, swept them around, you're gonna fill them full. And, and there's usually, like especially in production opens, you've got somebody back there pushing steers, you know? And if you've got somebody that's working a, a manual rope and chute, you've got somebody usually moving steers anyway, okay? I'm gonna skip the buck and chute for a second because I wanna stay on the, in the vein of uh, rope and chutes. These are a few other models that we have. This is called the RC98 AI. It's an automatic chute with an infrared eye in it. Now check out how cool this is, okay? This box right here, this is a remote control work rope and chute, okay? So I've got a remote in my hand. I can set a delay when I push the button and it'll delay up to what, 12 seconds? 30 now, 30 seconds? That's a long time to wait, but uh, you push the button and you've got a delay there that'll, uh, so if I wanted to set it for a five second delay so I could hit the button and get my rope ready, and then the, the gate opens, I can do that. Or I can set it where it's automatic. So I've got four buttons, and I literally can open the front gate, hit another button, close the front gate, another button opens the tailgate, another button closes it, okay? Then you can go into what I call robotic mode, and you flip a switch in the back, and basically you're telling the chute to do the work for you. So what you're doing is you're set up, you're the healer or whoever's got the remote. You hit the button, that pops the front gate. You take off, you're roping, you're doing your thing down the arena. It waits about five seconds. It closes the front gate by itself. It opens the tailgate by itself. The steer comes in to the, to the chute. An infrared eye that's mounted underneath that box sees the steer and closes the gate behind him. It's for really lazy people, all right? <laughs> really lazy people. But it's the coolest game in town, and all your friends think you're the coolest guy on the block, okay? Really a neat deal. That's our automatic rope and chute. Basically, functionality is the same, but you have a remote controlled and a robotic mechanism uh, with the infrared eye inside the chute. All of it hooks up. Do what? That, that is efficiency. If you're, if you're a roper, it's called efficiency. Now, this, is, this last year we came out with something that was absolutely revolutionary in the roping industry. This is called a score chute, okay? Eric, we've got to get this stuff hooked up. Can you handle that for us next time? Basically... Huh? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Thank you for asking, Joey. Uh, basically, this stuff all runs off of air. You've got to have a hookup so you have an air compressor. So you're going to have to have electricity and, and uh, air. Uh, we recommend about 90 pounds of pressure to be able to open and close the chute. A lot of people will put a compressor so they don't have to listen to it kick on and off. They'll put it away from there and run the lines. You can run it all down the alley and that kind of stuff with zip ties right into the chute. You're good to go. But you do have to have a compressor for those. Uh, now this little deal is one of the most ingenious things that they've ever come out with. This is called a score chute. If you'll notice inside here, there's a little bit of a, a head gate, kind of like, you know, a preferred head gate, okay? Everybody know what score means when I say score in the roping world? Everybody know what that means? When you back into a, when a header backs into a, the box to rope, this is the difference between a lot of times in competition, winning and losing. It's really not the guy always with the best horse, although that's important. It's not the, sometimes the best roper. When you're talking about, especially in the pros, uh, the more competitive it gets, it's every, all the best ones will tell you it's the best p score, the best guy to get out on the steer the fastest without breaking the barrier. Because they've got a rope barrier across the front. You've got to give the steer a head start. So you've got to know right when to leave. Well, if your horse is not listening to your cues and going when you tell him to go, and he's going off what he's been trained at home, a lot of these guys will use like ropes and stuff and they'll jerk a rope and it trips the gate. 
Well, every time the horse feels or sees this, he's gone. He knows it's time to go. And you want to break your horse from that. So what you do as a roper is you train your horse to sit in the box comfortably. Don't jump and lose your mind just because the gate opens. Listen to me. I'm the, I'm the driver. You listen to me. So scoring is when you back your horse in the box and you'll sit there and you'll nod and somebody will open the gate and let a steer run out. Of course, your horse, you know, he wants to go, but you hold him back and you say, nope, we don't chase every steer. So you close the gate, then you let another steer go. When your horse wants to go, you hold him back and say, nope, you sit here till I tell you to go. You're training him that not every time that gate slams or every time that steer leaves, he goes on your command. That's called scoring. Now, if you do that four or five times, your horse finally, you'll get to the point where the first time he jumps, second time he fidgets, third time he's nervous, by the fourth time he's sitting still, fifth time no movement because he realizes he gets the idea, okay? So that's called scoring. The only problem with that is if you only own 10 steers that you're roping, you just spent five of them scoring your horse and you want to do that frequently, so now you're spending all your roping time chasing steers. So Prefort came up with an absolutely ingenious, and I don't, this was you and Speed Williams and Nate's idea, is that basically right? A lot of people would throw blankets down over the front so the steer wouldn't leave. Y'all might have seen that. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. But what we did was we, this is an automatic, it's got remote controls. And these things normally are, uh, are, are slid back okay into position out of the way so these aren't into play most of the time and you rope 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 <coughs> release it see how those fold back so the steers are coming through you're doing your deal now let's say Eric's backed over in the box and he says I'm gonna score a couple of times okay his horse is jumping out too fast he's gonna break the barrier so he backs in there and he takes his remote control and he closes the head gate just like that. Now what he's done is he's got a head gate inside the gate. So he's caught the steer by the neck. So now when he releases the front, the steer can't go. But for the horse, the, he heard the noise, he saw the gate, the steer even lurched trying to get out of there, but he can't go. And so you score him. So you can watch the video. We've done a lot of testing. You watch that horse jump, and you can do it again and again. I can sit here and score 10 times until my horse is dead, no movement whatsoever. And I can do it frequently without running steers up and down the arena all day. Because you want to keep your steers fresh. Okay? Very important. So this is like one of the best roping training tools there are. All the pros are going to this. Uh, this shoot retails for $4,500. That's $1,800, $4,500 and they lined up for this stuff. Before we could sell them, we had a list mile long to, to, to buy these things. I mean, fantastic item. Any questions? You, on an automatic shoot? Well, we have a one year's manufacturer uh, warranty on workmanship and you know parts and things, but we pretty much, we've got guys that call about their boxes and stuff, my computer went bad or whatever, and we, we fix them up nearly every time. To protect ourselves, we have to put that one year warranty on there, but we're gonna make the customer happy. We always fix it for them, or trade them out. Do you have a question, Dave? Is there a possibility of getting a head gate in this piece? You know, we've, we talked about that. Where did we leave that last time? We had it where it was a manual process at one time. Where did we leave off? You remember? We just didn't really have that much need for it. At that one time, we was working on it as a competition standpoint about trying to help hold that steer's head straight. But we just had some issues there with trying to, uh, you know, release them both at the same time and try to, you know, make that steer break as hard as they needed to, or like they would out of a single head gate. And we just felt like the guys that were really training, they're gonna have an automatic shoot there anyway. That's yeah. basically where- Yeah, you're always gonna see the manual one in competition, but you're gonna see this in the practice pen because it's hard to get shoot help, you know, to help you. So push button works good. Now, this is the newest one. This has just come out. You guys, in fact, are the first pre group 
that we've had that'll see this shoot in training. Huh? What are you doing? What are you looking for? Is it powered up? Yeah. Oh, it's charged. I got gotcha. you. Know, fix to say, I'm used plug to compressors. In, plug it in. Yeah, plug it. Where's the wire? Uh, this is the Q36, and they got the name from, uh, I don't even want to tell you really. I told you that we speak fluent smart aleck around here. Do y'all remember Marvin the Martian on Bugs Bunny? Yeah. Remember he used to say, it's the Q36 space modulizer, you know, and he was going to blow up the earth or whatever. That's where they came up with it because this is so sophisticated or whatever. So that's literally where the name came from, which would be a great test question. Um, and if you answer it, you have to do it in that voice. You have to do the Marvin the Martian voice, okay? That'd be fun. Uh, what we've done is we've basically said, okay, sometimes out in an arena it's hard to have electricity and compressors and that kind of stuff. And what if the power's out? Now I can't rope. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, so what we've done here is we've basically we've made a, a, uh, a solar panel. This On top of this box right up here, is a solar panel right here and this thing will hold a charge like in this room right here there's a battery in here and the solar panel will charge it up during the day and this battery can run this chute we've depended on, on moderate use for about 30 days so it runs it for a long time okay so the solar panel right here is nearly virtually indestructible charges the battery mechanism that's in here it's pretty simple inside there's just basically a little solenoid trigger and when I push the button, you get a front release, and uh, the rest of it becomes manual after that fact. It's just basically the front release, which is what you want when you're roping mostly, because you don't mind coming back and doing the rest of it. So, uh, I'm just going to close it by hand, and I mean, all horseback, and you can still work the tailgate on it. Yeah. Yes. Here, here's the great thing. You can buy it just like you see it. A lot of people are right now. But you, this little box right here comes in a comes nice labeled box. You can set it on your shelf. About 550 bucks for this thing. And, uh, man, I'm telling you what, this is going to be one of the hottest items of this year. We're advertising it real hard in all the roping magazines, Spin to Win, Super Looper, you name it, Roping Pin, all those magazines. And so this is going to be a pretty hot item for... Uh, for uh, this year and several to come. You got to have power air. You got to have power air. Oh yeah, you can still operate them. You can flip it. You know, I mean, I can walk up here and. You can use it absolutely. Like if you lose power, you can use it, but you're not going to use it as it's intended. Yeah. All right, I'm going to jump back over here to the bucket chute real quick. You guys aren't going to sell a whole bunch of these, but you at least need to know that we have them because y'all might have local fairs and rodeos in your town that might want to upgrade. This, is, this thing's a space shuttle compared to anything else out there. Cody Lambert, Tuff Hedeman, Mike White, Chris Shivers, Adriano Marias, all of those guys helped us develop this. We went to them and said, hey, you guys come into the shop. We want to know what's wrong and what's right with buck and shoots we want you to help us design it and we came up with a slew of uh changes to this shoot this is a very sophisticated uh item it doesn't look like it, it looks like just a five thousand pound bundle of steel there's a lot of stuff in here we've got adjustments down on the bottom for gate leveling the gate mechanism itself the way the slam latch works is uh is very revolutionary the design of the rails right here uh, for comfort of the animal and the cowboy, especially if I used to ride bulls and that was the worst part of the experience. It wasn't the riding and the getting off and getting away from the bull. It was getting your legs smashed inside those pipes on the inside of the chute. So what we've done is taken an oval disc, made it very comfortable for the riders. There's just a lot of stuff in here. We use rumber uh, in the, in the uh, doors. Another thing that we do, you can't appreciate it really on this side, but on the back side, most bucking shoots like WW and others, 
the gate rolls on a rail that goes out. So you're on the flank board, you have to walk around it or duck underneath the rail. Well, ours rolls on the floor. So you can pull it back and forth, back there on the flank board, and you're unobstructed, okay? So there's just a lot of stuff. This is a powder-coated product. It's about 500 pounds heavier than our number one competitor, which is WW. Uh, basically, uh, uh, it's just a heavier duty all the way around. You slam it shut, pop the lock, you're good to go. You can adjust the uh, spring setting right here with this set of bolts. It's just a really good buck and shoot. Uh, this is the one that everybody, all the big boys use, NFR, PBR, all the rest of them. To give you an idea how durable these things are, PBR rotates. We have several sets they use. We rotate them out. They use two sets each year. And the third one comes back as a lease set, and we repaint it. They've been using the same three sets of buck and shoots for how long, Eric? Do you know? Oh, it's longer than that. I was six or seven at least. I mean, I, I didn't know if it was longer than that. It's been a while. But they, they take these things on and off a truck. Uh, they have 34 vents, so you're talking about 68 times on and off a truck, hauling around, banging, you know, setting up. Most of these things get set in place, and boom, that's it. So if it'll, if it'll make it through hauling down the road and all the elements and the toughest bulls on the world and the banging and all that with a forklift, believe me, it'll work for your fairgrounds. Really good shoot. Really excited about that. All right, we're going to move over here. This is a calf shoot. Obviously, just a little bit smaller. Uh, all the features are just basically the same as the RC98M. You've got the same uh, release mechanisms. You have one side, of course. Now, this product right here is something I get excited about. You know, there are certain products, like I said, that you say they got one, I got one, you know, me too type of thing. And then there's products that really stand out. Obviously, the rope and shoots and rodeo equipment that we do stand out. The head gate, the squeeze chutes, those kind of things. This is another standout item. The best part about this is how inexpensive that arena groomer is. It retails for, I think, $29.50 uh, right now, if I recall correctly. It's right at the $3,000 mark. But man, you talk about doing a great job. I showed y'all a slide earlier. That was a 150 by 250 arena. We made it, we let it grow up. It had grass in it, it was packed, the whole deal. 12 minutes later, we had that thing groomed and ready to ride. I mean, it was, it was good to go. We've got these uh, spring-loaded S-tines down here in the bottom. And uh, that are basically, you, you see they've got the, the S-tines, so it's got that, uh, it agitates the dirt as it's coming through. And it's three-point. It's not just a pull behind, so you can actually lower or raise for how aggressive you want to be. If you want to go two inches, if you want to go down four inches however deep you want to be, you can lower it with your three-point. Uh, it's got the uh, basket roller, it's got a leveling bar on the back right here uh, to level the dirt across the arena so you don't have big high places. Then on the back it's got a, a, a basket which basically breaks your clods up and, uh, and fluffs the dirt as you're going through the arena. So it's rolling and flipping the dirt up and the, the difference is just amazing to watch this uh, this thing go into an arena with a bunch of grass and packed out and you know uh, and just watch the how amazing it is. Arena drags we build some for some other companies. We do some OEM manufacturing and we build drags for people that you know are eight thousand dollars all the way to eighteen thousand dollars and do some pretty big hydraulics and all kinds of stuff. But this little deal right here, I don't recommend it for clay. If you got a, a, a real a lot of high clay content soil, but if you got a sandy or a sandy loam soil, man, this thing right here is hard to beat, especially for the money. I mean, it's a great product. Then you've got this blade back here; it folds up out of the way when you're not using it, and adds a little bit more weight that helps get uh, get the uh, drag itself down in the dirt. But basically, that blade can be drugged behind. It can be set and pinned to be more aggressive and actually dig. You can even use it to back. It's almost like a uh, like a dozer blade. You can actually push dirt with it. So if you need to push dirt back in the box or 
uh, wherever you need to do. It's it's a handy little tool. And uh, we have sold a kajillion of them. So if you've got a big horse market, uh, this is a product that I would highly recommend that you consider stocking. This is a good item. You're not going to get stuck with an item like this. It's a good one. Anybody have any questions about that? All these tines are replaceable. They would happen to break them off. You will dull these over time. You wouldn't think that you would, but uh, these guys drag these high tensile steel through the sand and that sand just erodes that steel over time. So you have to replace the tips uh, down here occasionally or sometimes you'll get caught up in something and have to replace one of the tines, but they're easy to do. Do what? Sizes. Oh, they come in a six and an eight. Good question. He's been setting me up all day today. Six and an eight footer. Um, and you can also get a water kit put on the top of them, by the way. You can actually get a water kit that uh, will uh, help keep the dust down. You know, it's got a sprayer on the back, so it's a pretty neat little deal. Let's go over to our highest volume stuff now. We're getting into our high volume stuff. This is your your panel. This is your bread and butter right here. You got your panel section, so everybody get where you can see. And we're just going to work our way up from uh, baby bear all the way up to popper bear, okay? Uh, first of all, this is an economy panel. What colors is this available in? Red and green. Okay. This is a red and green uh, product, okay, uh, primarily. And it's got a chain connector because chain connectors are what? Why Safety chain connectors? And Safety. Safety and convenience, okay. Uh, you know, this is made out of an inch and five-eighths or a one-six-six, see the way you like to say it, decimal and fraction, uh, tubing. But you notice we don't do the fish hooks. What's the fish hooks for? Safety and strength, okay. We do the bed frame style. This panel used to be a pin panel. We converted it based on customer request to a chain connector. People just like, they've got to the point where pins are just not popular anymore, except in the rodeo world. Uh, so we put a chain connector on it last year or year before. This is basically our down and dirty cheap panel. The reason we do the bed frame style here is because it's cheaper. Now, it's just the fastest way you can build panels and gates. But using a chain connector, it eliminates the foot trap. You're gonna have you're gonna have a little bit of trap right here, so it's not horse safe. We don't advertise it horse safe like this one, but this is this is what most of the panels in the country are sold like, and it's just fine. Does the trick, okay? It's a lightweight panel. It's 20 gauge, okay? What gauge is it? 20, 20 gauge, okay? So it's lightweight, easy to carry around. Great for arenas. Great for round pins. If I'm doing colt starting on a Mustang, do I want to use this panel? No. no. I want to use a taller panel because they're going to challenge it. And I probably want to use what gauge of panel? 16, 16 gauge. Does, do we make a panel that would be suitable for Mustangs? Yes. Where is it? That's right. It's the, it's the premier panel, 10 inches taller. We call it the PPT, the premier panel tall. Okay, y'all saw that over there a while ago. What gauge is that? 16. And what is the rails? It's called what? No, that's the that's the stay is drilled. What's the rail uh, name of the rails that we do the shape? Quadriform. Quadriform. Very good. It comes primarily in what color? Gray. Gray. Okay, you can get it in other colors, but primary gray and gray means strength. Okay. Seventy-two inches tall for the PPT. Anybody for bonus points? Can you remember what the PP like the PP panel is? The PP twelve, for example. 64. All right, bonus points for you guys. And again, what's the shape of the tubing? Quadriform. Very good. Okay, so this panel is available in what two colors? Red and green. Red and green, okay. Good. Which color did you say? Galvanized. Galvanized. Uh, 20 gauge panel. Now let's step up to the next one up in the list. This is one of the most popular panels in the entire country. Uh, this is a 10-footer. The 12-footer is the most popular. Everybody in here stocking UP panels, UP12s? Man, this is a great panel. People love this panel. We've advertised it for years. We built a real market on it. This has got all the whistles and bells, and it's still a nice, inexpensive, lightweight panel. It's, 60, uh, it's $97 retail, okay? It's inexpensive. 
It's got the chain connector. It's got the fish hooks. And what does the fish hooks do? Safety, Safety and strength. It's 20 gauge. It's got the uh, oval side so I can butt them one back up to the other and they can't roll off each other. No foot traps. It's got the drilled stays. Uh, I mean, it is just, it's got the J leg, of course, for easy movement. That is, that is a great panel right there. That is my, one of my favorites. But for the money, you got one here that's 16 gauge, the PP panel, y'all have already seen it. It's 16 gauge. This one, for example, weighs 58 pounds. This one weighs 97 pounds. That's the difference in the same length, 20 gauge versus 16 gauge. It's, it's nearly double in weight. It's pretty amazing, another 40 pounds. So, uh, uh, very, for the money, it's horse safe but cattle tough. It'll hold, you're gonna see tomorrow, we're gonna be pressing cows against these things and you'll see that they hold up just fine. The PP panel is a, a great panel, okay? Then you move on over here to the next one and this is the one we just talked about, the PPT. And it's how tall? 72, 72 inches tall, excellent. Uh, the rail is again called quadriform. What kind of stay do we use? Drilled stays. And the, why we, why we do the fish hooks? Safety. safety, safety and strength. Now you roll over here to the arena panel, which we saw a while ago. And it's what gauge? 16, 16 gauge. It's made out of uh, 1.9 or two inch. You can basically, that's equivalent to two inch tubing. It's round and it has, it's not a drilled stay. You notice it's got weld in stays that, that's too big to drill. Those holes would, compromise the integrity of the rail to put a hole that big through there. Now this is one you didn't see over there a while ago. This is also a rodeo panel. It's also 16 gauge, but this one, notice doesn't have a leg on it. It has to have a post. And they do this because they need three and four way connectors, so you have to use post. And those are for all those bull housing and that kind of stuff in the back. So this is a rough stock panel, and it requires that you have a post some type of connector post, two, three, four way connector that goes with it. And then this little fella down here is called the Pirelli panel. He calls them Pirelli play pins. Pat Pirelli, uh, everybody know him, kind of a horse clinician. He likes to have a low profile uh, pin, just something that's a barrier for his horses. So we do offer that uh, for him and a lot of his people buy those things. So we're glad to sell them to him, okay? So you got the economy panel. You got the utility panel, the premier panel, the PPT, the arena panel, the rough stock panel. 14 gauge, that's right, who said that? Where are you? Yes, it's 14 gauge, did I say 16? Sorry, that's 14 gauge, that's for holding the bulls in the back. 14, 16, 16, 16, 20, 20. Okay, that's pretty easy to remember. Yes, sir, it does. Sure do. You can hook this panel right into a WW panel. You bet. Did that intentionally. So uh, we sell a bunch of those things. Any questions about panels? Okay. Uh, now keep in mind with the powder coat we talked about this morning, you're going to see it applied today. It's going to make more sense to you. But it's all about the preparation, the surface preparation. And you're going to see the willow braider in action this afternoon. We're going to move along here. This, is, this next item is a, a horse stock. I, I don't know. There may be one or two other people that build one. Most of these are built in place. Uh, anybody know what the purpose of a horse stock is? Vets use them. Yeah. Vets are going to use them, okay? They're, this is kind of like a squeeze chute that doesn't squeeze for a horse, okay? So if you're branding or medicating, if you need to float teeth, see, you can hang the horse's head right from here and float his teeth after you drug him. Uh, you can hang IV bags on the side or halters. Uh, you can raise or lower this gate to three different settings. It's got emergency exits on both sides. Basically, you pull the animal in to one side. You know what most people use these for? Wash racks. They're perfect. If you've got a little kid that washes animals, you don't want that horse jumping around and you step it on the kid, you put them in this, and it's, it's a great wash rack is what it is. But we sell a lot of horse stocks, do pretty well with it. 
Uh, you can get it. They come standard when you just order a horse stock. It doesn't come with this platform down here. It just comes where you can bolt it in the ground. You can get ground anchors and you can concrete those in the ground and then bolt the stock to it. Uh, you can take just the stock itself and bolt it into existing concrete with a Hilti bolt. Or you can buy the scale platform uh, just like you see it here and you can actually put uh, load bars under the bottom of it if you want to and actually weigh your animal as well. So great little product if you've got a barn with a wash rack putting that in the middle of the wash rack is a pretty good idea. Moving right along you've got a couple of different feeders here that you see we put this over here <clears throat> this is a, a round bell feeder skirted round bell feeders for horses what used to this was the only one this is a very high volume very popular item uh, this round bell feeder for horses. Some people use them for steers or horned animals as well. Uh, recently, and when I say recently, within the last three or four years, we started doing tombstone feeders uh, and it has gone extremely well. These tombstone feeders sell real well. It's got the foot on the bottom to keep it out of the mud and the muck. It's easier when, it, when the ground freezes to pop those three legs out of the bottom instead of having to pop the whole ring out of the bottom. We do a few things that are different. Most people take the tombstone itself and they're going to come up and weld it right here and both of them are welded on the top well that's easy to bend you know and break you got you know thousand pound horse leaning on that constantly they're going to break it if you'll notice what we do is we weld one here on the top come up and down inside and weld it in two places down here all the way to the bottom of the frame so it's a lot a lot stronger than what you're going to get with just two welds on the top so a little extra attention to detail, a little more quality uh, built into that feeder, and it's been a great uh, little selling feeder for us. Um, this is going to change. I told you earlier that we're starting to go to a powder coat version. We're going to change the horse uh, feeders, these two right here, to brown. You're going to be brown powder coated, and man, they look great. I had a few up at a customer up north the other day, and they were beautiful, weren't they, Chip? Did you see them? It was your idea to do it in the first place and you hadn't even got to see them yet. They were beautiful. So you've got the gray uh, for the heavy duty uh, round bell feeders. You're going to have the blue for the economy round bell feeders. And then you're going to have the brown so you'll know the, the horse feeders. And man, they look good in brown. Really good. Got a rich color. We also do a uh, hay and grain feeder here. We do some things that are a little different takes a little cost a little more you can buy a cheaper hay and grain feeder but we sell hundreds and hundreds of these one of the first things that I would point out to you about this besides the fact that it's powder coated with a slide in liner which is replaceable is the fact that it's rounded that's one of the most important features of this feeder a lot of them are square now it's a lot cheaper and faster to build them square but why wouldn't you who can imagine why a square feeder is not a good idea the corners are terrible with horses. Why? Because the feed gets back in the corners, they can't get it, and then it gets wet, and then it starts doing what? Molding and mildewing, and then now your horse is ingesting molds, and now you got a colicky horse, and here we go, all right? So it's important. That's the reason we designed these with this rounded feature. All the feed's going to settle to the bottom. Also, water can't get trapped down in there. They're gonna, it's going to drain out through the weep holes here on the sides. All the feed's going to stay down at the bottom. They're going to get 100% uh, consumption, which is going to keep feed from uh, getting in the corners and, uh, and mold and mildew. It'll obviously hold about a flake of hay here. And uh, again, got a replaceable liner. Pretty good little feeder. You can get it in multiple colors. It comes standard in brown, but you can also order it in other colors to match your place. Okay? Now, this is a very popular item right here. This is a pasture feeder is what we call it, uh, a pasture horse feeder, uh, five foot, it's got the double, a lot of them will have a single, but you don't see too many that have the double feeders on both sides. Very important there if you're feeding grain, you got horses that are in a, have a pecking order, you want to have plenty of room for them because you've seen one horse run the rest of them off. You can throw you a square bale of hay in there feed grain from both sides. Notice how wide the legs are at the bottom. Uh, 
very heavy duty feeder, stick it out in the pasture and you're good to go. We redesigned this one a few years ago and uh, made some changes to it, actually lowered the price by about $150 or so and made it, in my opinion, a much better feeder. So uh, it used to be all steel and had solid sides and that kind of thing. We also have a roof kit that's available for this thing. Some of you may have seen it in the catalog. The roof kit actually bolts on the side and will keep the, uh, the contents of this feeder completely dry if you're feeding expensive alfalfa hay or something like that. You may want to do that and grains, minerals, whatever you're putting in here for your horses. So uh, that is a great product. We sell a ton of them. We also have a smaller version of that. This is kind of the little brother to that feeder. It'll still hold a bale of hay uh, up in the top, but it's got a single bunk here. The, the footing is not quite as wide on the bottom. It's not quite as, as stable uh, as this feeder is, but it's a, it's a good economical uh, backup if you don't if that's too much feeder for you. If you got one or two horses out in the pasture that's going to work fine for you. Okay. Uh, we talked about water tanks a while ago. This is an example of one of the Rubbermaid tanks. Uh, I mean these things are super tough. You know you can take a Rubbermaid tank and uh, hey Eric, just bring back memories. Uh, you can take a Rubbermaid tank and pretty much throw it around and do whatever you want. You don't want to do that with a galvanized tank, obviously, because what's going to happen? You're going to make, bend it and get leakers and that kind of stuff. These Rubbermaid tanks are fantastic as far as uh, durability. I've got this exact tank, in fact, in my pasture right now for horses. And uh, man, it holds up great during the winter time. Easy to clean out. It's just they make a great product. So that's available to you to ship on your truck. We also make the uh, galvanized tanks. You guys saw the round over here for cattle. We make a series for, uh, or buy and sell a series of oval tanks uh, for uh, sheep and goats and, you know, the low profile one footers. And then we've got the two footers like this for horses. 100 gallon, the two, the two, 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 or two, four, two, or yeah, the two, four, two, I think it is, is the most popular 100 gallon. Uh, water for horses, and that's that's uh, what we got here. Uh, stalls, real quick. These are what this is called the Premier Series of stalls. First thing I would point out to you is uh, that we make a wood kit for stalls. You guys see that? That wood kit is the way to go right there. By the time you go cut your wood, you try to stain it. You're not going to get as good a product as we've got there, and you're really going to spend close to the same money. You save a little bit. But right here, what we've got is a board that's cut to fit. You got the right, one kit fills an entire front. It's cut to fit, it's beveled, it's stained, and it's, uh, and it's ready to go. I mean, it's ready to slide in. You cut the last one and you're done. Okay? Huh? Oh, yeah, and it's tongue and groove. That's the most important part. I knew I was leaving something out. It's beveled, tongue and groove, stained, cut to fit. You just pop it in slide it down you're ready to go very convenient there's several different looks that you see right here in these four stalls right over here you've got a bar top a vertical bar top and you notice you've got two windows in here we also have this feeder that fits in our premier stalls you can pop the windows out and put the feeder in okay and I'm gonna talk about that more here in just a minute because we've redesigned that feeder with the new stall but you see that's a, 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 a vertical top with a poly bottom. You see this one's got a mesh top with a wood bottom. Here's a vertical bar top with a wood bottom. And here's a mesh on mesh. So you can kind of combine these any way you want. You can put the mesh with the poly. Doesn't matter. You pick the top, you pick the bottom that, that you want, okay? Ma'am? Well, it depends on what your needs are. Like in most barns, they're going to have, this is the most popular stall right here, vertical bar with wood bottom. Most barns are going to have that. If you go into commercial barns, they, they're scrubbing down, if they have horses coming in and out, like exposition centers especially, they go with the poly. It's very durable and it's easy to clean. It doesn't, they can spray it down with chemical, wash it, power wash it. It doesn't harbor bacteria and mold and that kind of stuff, so it's a little better than wood in that way. And, uh, and it's very doable. You don't have to worry about it rotting and replacing that kind of stuff. But most people in a barn 
they want that wood look it's tradition you know so and it works great this is great if you need if airflow is a problem you're down here in texas we want air pulling through those barns you open both ends of the barns let that create that wind vacuum and uh you want to have plenty of ventilation but you want to keep separation in there so you can go all mesh if you want to notice we put the kick plate at the bottom and that kind of thing all prefer stalls uh, we've got plungers the idea is that we want a, a, a 10 year old girl going to feed her horse be able to not have to fight with a gate which is a common problem in stalls so what we do is we use apple core rollers with bearings it i can you literally do it with my finger pull it down i can open that stall i mean it just nearly rolls by itself it's just a really good got a slam latch ready to go it is a very high quality stall uh, again you've got feeder options now this is the old style feeder and i say old style y'all are the first group that are going to get to find out about the the new stall that's about to come out so i'm glad this is kind of one of the reasons i saved this to last uh, this is how you feed grain in the old way you pop you pop it in there's a bucket right there then you let it slam shut open this put a flake of hay in there slam shut the, the way you see these stalls right now is about to change okay we're going to change our the whole look of this stall behind me this one is going away all these that you see many of you have sold these for years we've improved on it first of all instead of doing an oval inch and five eighths tubing we're going to a full is it one two inch going to a two inch round tubing instead of doing the connectors like you see there kind of like the dog kennel connectors they're going to be pin connector just like those rodeo panels over there okay and our expo stall so they're going to be pin connected two inch tubing so they look really robust we move the door by popular demand to the center instead of the left or right of line this one happens to be reversible i can pop this around put the door on the other side and have a right door instead of a left that's going away we put a header bar on the top so that you guys can forklift it around your yard without damaging it because these things are hard to move as they are you have to get under them now you're going to be able to go into them and pick them up just like a panel because they basically got a header over the top door is going to be in the center <clears throat> nice little finger latch right here to open the windows you're going to have the same options as far as uh, windows versus feeders but what's cool about it is we came up with a really cool idea i think now you've only got one door to deal with when it comes to putting hay in okay you, you'll have the one door but you don't have to do that to feed grain what we what we did was we inset this feeder we made a v shape right here and we inset it about six inches so now all you have to do to feed grain is let, let's say you've got a little cart with your feed you know your grain you'll go down the whole stall row and you just dump it in the hole it's open right here in the in the buckets right below it so now you don't have to open anything to feed grain or go inside the stall if you didn't have a feeder <clears throat> okay so it's a lot cooler and it, we call it a little feed uh, funnel so that's a, some neat stuff that's coming two inch tubing center door brand new feeder um, header across the top everything else is kind of the same but uh, it's really an improvement on the stall we're all excited about it we've got jigs built we should be you'll you'll be seeing information on that in the next few months okay got a couple of items here laid out for you this is uh, some of our three-point line we had a lot more three-point but we narrowed it down to the most uh, common uh, most popular items that we got uh, we'll start right here and I'm just gonna run through these I'm not gonna go through a lot of detail with them we're just gonna kind of talk about them uh, this is a quick connect bar I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen these but they're real handy basically it allows you to pull up to a to an implement and set it you pull up to the implement and uh, pop it in and then it locks shut on top of it and it's, it keeps you from having to get on and off your tractor very handy little tool that top sets up there so that's a quick connect obviously this is a trailer mover that doesn't take a lot of uh, explanation to understand that but it's got a, a place for a hitch in the back 
uh, and then it's got one for a gooseneck there on the top. All this is three point. You notice we don't use the pins. Bill doesn't like, he welds on the ears, it's a lot stronger. You ever see those that's got the pins welded on? He doesn't like that because he we own a lot of tractors, do a lot of farm work. He gets frustrated breaking those things and bending them and that kind of thing. So we put the ears in there and you buy your own pins to put through. This is a middle buster. Boy, if you want to tear up somebody's front yard that made you mad, this is the thing to use. It'll dig a trench like you wouldn't believe. Uh, great high tensile uh, blade on it. Again's got the ears, it's three point, and uh, you can set that sucker as low as you want to go, and I mean really fold the dirt back. It'll really make a mess. Uh, this one right here is uh, called a subsoiler right here. If you'll look at the part number on that, it's a preferred implement subsoiler, or PISS for short. We hate that part number, but uh, that's actually the way it worked out. So it's actually on the tag, and we get a lot of comments about it. Uh, subsoiler basically comes through, and if you want to, if you need to tear a line, you know, if you're going to put like a water line or something like that, and you want to rip the, the ground to get it started, it's a great way to do it. This thing will make a mess too. We have a variety of spears. You see this uh, steer, spear here. We don't have some of the other ones that we have for skid steers and different things. We even have a quad spear uh, that we use. It's got four teeth on it. Boy, they're, it's great for picking up uh, brush and you can spear two bales of hay at one time, carry on the front, very, very handy. But we have a variety of different spears uh, available to you. This is one of the oldest products in the company, way back before we jumped into the three-point line big time. Uh, this is a bale buck, and uh, basically it's just uh, used for sliding up underneath the bale. Notice it's extra long, extra wide. You get up under the bale, pick it up with the back of your tractor and, and carry it where you're going. One of my favorite tools, I use this all the time, nearly every other weekend. This is a landscape rake. Comes in a variety of sizes. Uh, the eight footer, boy, it really does some, uh, some damage. This is a six footer, you see. Little things that we do to our implements that are, I wish I could go into this in detail if we had more time. We do a few little extra things, like for example, the kickstand. You notice the kickstand on the front of that thing, that doesn't, in, make a lot of extra expense but boy it sure is convenient especially for our older customers not having to get back there and pull that thing up now you've got it standing up out there ready to go you back your tractor right into it especially if you've got one of our quick connects you back up to it lift it up and drive away and never get off your tractor very handy so quick kickstands are great you can turn this thing around you pull this pin right here you can spin it around and push instead of drag uh, with it, but boy, this landscape rake, I'll tell you what I do with it. I drag it across the ground when I'm going to seed and let it rip and agitate the ground, and then I'll go back and seed and then come back over it again with that. Man, it is fantastic. You can do that with a chain here, obviously, but this you can get as aggressive as you need to be because you got control of it with the three point. Great for dragging limbs and cleaning up and smoothing out ground. This thing is very, very aggressive, but not as harsh because it doesn't dig into the soil like a box blade or a rear blade. That, to me, is one of the best tools we make right there. You come on over to the box blade. Bill Prefort believes, uh, when in doubt, build it stout. So we build this stuff to take a lot of abuse. A box blade and a rear blade really take a lot of, and there's not even a rear blade over here, takes a, a lot of abuse. And so uh, he beefs it up. We do a, uh, make sure that they're not going to fail. When he takes it out, he puts it on a, you know, a hundred horse tractor and tries to rip every stump out of the planet, you know, with it. And, and if it breaks, then it's not strong enough. So these are, when I say it stays sold, I mean, this is what I'm talking about. Heavy duty, beefy. It's got the, uh, the shanks down in it. It's got the, uh, uh, a great high tensile, uh, blade on it. Uh, uh, three point, obviously the same. It's got the ears. Uh, you've got a harrow, right? Or a, uh, what do we call this here? Cultivator. cultivator. Got a cultivator. Thank you very much. Uh, we don't sell a tremendous amount of these. Depends on the part of the country that you're in. But uh, uh, we sell enough of them to keep that one going. So, again, kind of the same setup with the ears and that kind of stuff. Great for gardening and farming. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of different models. We've got a heavy duty and we've got a light weight or a little lighter weight. Uh, you can see the difference here. This one's got uh, angle iron and that kind of stuff in it where that one's all 
square tubing. It's a little heavier, more robust. It's got the scallop blades as well as the sickle blades on it uh, uh, to agitate the ground and and uh, really nice, strong, heavy duty. These are two products. You think about these products you drag in the ground and by their definition, they've got to be strong. You're dragging them and they're hitting rocks and they're hitting roots and stumps and I mean just an enormous amount of, of abuse that that uh, is taken. We've got self cleaners uh, down here so you don't get uh, grass and stuff up here. We've got uh, cleaners on here that will take that stuff off of there and not get it to ball up around the blade. There's a lot of little extra things that we do in these items that I don't have time to discuss today. You guys see the mower back here? We've got a couple of different uh, mowers. Uh, this is a standard dewy mower right here. You notice it's an RMS. S means standard. You've got the RMX, that's the middle one, and then you've got an RMH, which is the heavy duty. Basically what that means is the thickness of the gauge and, the, and how robust all the gear system is and that kind of thing on it. We use a slip clutch on our mowers and our tiller. We don't use a shear pin. We use a shear pin actually on this one on the standard duty, but we use a slip clutch on the other one, so you've got to burn that in. Uh, when you first get it ready to go, that's going to save your uh, your gearbox by having that slip clutch. And if you're going to buy something as expensive as a mower, you want it to last. Uh, we've got this designed so that it free flows as you go up and down terrain. It will allow the top hitch, you notice, to move back and forth, uh, which will allow that thing to flow downhills, uphills, that kind of thing. Uh, we build our own stump jumpers. We tried to buy those. Most people buy those from China. Problem with that is if they're off balance, have you ever seen, that's what tears a mower up is, is the wobbling. You notice, you ever see somebody stop and they just the mower just sitting there doing this? We build our own stump jumpers because we can make them better balanced than the ones that we can buy. So we put our own stump jumpers under here, slip clutch. This of course is uh, not a beer holder. It's, a, uh, it's for your literature and that kind of stuff, warranty information. Uh, got uh, access uh, points right here through the top, so when you're changing blades and that kind of thing. Uh, heavy duty rear wheels, heavy gauge tops, 10 gauge tops on the standard, on the heavy and the, and the RMX. We also do a finish mower. I've used this thing, man, it, is, it cuts it like the finest lawn mower you've ever seen. Really, really good. A mower. I wish I had time to go into all the details of that uh, system, but just a real good deal. I used one of these nearly all day yesterday. I used a six footer. Uh, this is a five footer that you see right here, but I'm going to tell you something. You could take this tiller right here, set it up. I think it's the best one on the market by far. You take this, got a slip clutch on it as well, and I burned, I burned the clutch yesterday. It smells bad when you do that. I backed into something but it protected the gearbox from, from uh, breaking and I was able to pull off of it, go right back to work. You can take this tiller right now and run it through the thickest grass we've got out here and as you make that plast pass through there in first gear, you've got nothing but pulverized dirt as deep as you chose to set it. This is one of the most amazing tools uh, I've ever seen. We sell a lot of these and again, under a tremendous amount of duress constantly. I mean, it's just in the dirt, getting pounded on, hitting roots, hitting rocks, stumps, and uh, really does a great job as far as uh, agitating the dirt. I, I made a garden in about, for my uh, fiance yesterday in, in about uh, five or 10 minutes. I mean, just as fast as you can drive, one pass, you're ready to go. So, uh, pretty, pretty good tool. This is another pretty cool tool. This is called a land leveler. You can get it in a six and an eight. This thing's designed like if you've got a driveway, like a gravel driveway, this will pull. Notice it's offset and these blades are set two inches lower than the frame. Drags along the ground and it will actually pull the gravel that washes off the road to the side. It will pull that gravel. You go down the right side of the road, it will actually pull the gravel back up and crown it on top of the road. This is one of my favorite tools I've even used this, this is a great land leveling tool. You can go out in your pasture and literally run this thing right across the ground just like it is now and it will level the land. It'll take it the high spots to low spots and uh, really does a good job of, of land leveling. But 
it's made for mostly driveways and that kind of stuff. You can take it on this gravel road right out here, and that's what we use a lot of times when we're not using maintainers. Drag it along, it pulls the gravel up, and uh, and uh, just is a heck of a tool. I, I leveled my place with one of these last year, and uh, it scrapes the ground perfectly and does a good job. Have you used one of these much, Eric? You use it a lot. We've got a chain harrow here. It's the last product we're gonna talk about today. Uh, obviously, you can buy just the harrow mat itself. There's a whole bunch of sizes you can get. You can get it in a four by four mat, you can, get it in, you can get it eight, you can get it 12 across. Like this is a 12 right here. This is the kind of thing I would wanna use at my place. Very aggressive chain. Uh, this has got a lift boom on it. If you just buy the mat itself with the draw bar, uh, you can't go across cattle guards, you can't drive down the road, that kind of stuff. You can't drive across your yard. You gotta, you gotta be wanting to tear up wherever you park this thing and you know, each time. So you pick up the, you pick up the lift bar, draw bars on both sides and lift it up. I can carry it anywhere I wanna go. And I set it down where I wanna set it. If I'm dragging manure, if I'm aerating a pasture, uh, whatever I'm doing, uh, that this is a great tool. And like I said, you can buy them and multiple sizes six fours eights twelves whatever you want to want to use so everybody sells a lot of these chain heroes i'm sure in your store they're a very popular item